and I'm very pleased um, to be invited to talk to you. So, <coughs> children begin um, knowing no words. Um, by their second birthday, however, they typically know about a thousand words, and about half of these are object names. Children learn these object names through observation, by connecting heard words and seen things. Thus, there is a visual side to object name learning. And it seems highly likely that this visual side could pose serious limits or could constrain the very nature of breaking into language by children. It also seems likely that learning object names might play a role in the development of the visual processing through which we recognize objects. However, researchers in child language, most researchers in cognitive development, have, not, have focused on the language side and have not studied the visual side at all. Now, actually, there's a very good reason why they've done this, and that is because study after study shows that very young word learners, one and two-year-olds, are very, very good at recognizing common object categories. They are so good that a large number of theorists in cognitive development have posited that basic object categories come to babies for free, that visual perception carves nature at its joints. There are lots of studies. I'm just going to give you a couple examples. So in a recent study by Bergelson and Swingley, um, they were not interested in visual object recognition. No one in this field is. Um, they were interested in what object names babies know young. And so how they did that is they would put pictures of objects on a screen, and then they would say a name of one of them, banana, where's the banana, and then measure where the babies looked. By 12 months of age, infants robustly look to the named object for many object categories. Indeed, even nine-month-olds and six-month-olds do so reliably, though much more weakly, much more fragilely. But think about this. For these babies to do this, they have to recognize a never-seen-before picture of a banana. <clears throat> the second result which there's also lots and lots of data to support, concerns two-year-olds' almost magical ability to learn a whole category from, a single, from an experience with a single instance. This is often called the shape bias in the developmental literature because the driving similarity seems to be about object shape. Some of you, if you spent time with children nearing their second birth, they might have experienced this phenomena. Let's say you take some <clears throat> excuse me, some urban child out to the country like Indiana, and they see their first real tractor, a big John Deere working in the field. Child's fascinated. Just watches, watches, watches. And you name it, tractor, 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 farmer's field, tractor, tractor, tractor. Kids mesmerized. That's not the magical part. The magical part is days, weeks, months later, from that single experience, that child will spontaneously generalize the name tractor to the same kinds of objects that you do as an adult, to the Ferguson Massey, to the antique tractor, to the ride-on lawnmower, to all varieties of toy tractors, but not get them mixed up with other vehicles. So it seems that visual, visual object recognition is easy for one to two-year-olds. But as you know, it's pretty hard to explain. So what I want to do today is tell you what we have been learning about the visual side of early object name learning in one to two-year-olds. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you first a little bit, very briefly, about what we do and do not know. Then I'm going to talk, uh, concentrate on one major development that happens between one and two in visual object recognition. And then I'll move to our work where we're trying to capture the infant perspective um, on their experiences of early object categories, trying to determine what the training set is for these developments. So what we know. <clears throat> visual object, one, one thing we know is that visual object recognition has a very long developmental trajectory. We actually don't know very much about visual object recognition, infants and toddlers, because most of the research in vision on infant and toddlers has focused on fundamental visual mechanisms and has not looked at everyday object categories of the kind that infants have lots and lots of experiences with. There's only a handful, a little bit of research in that area. 
But we do know from studies of children older than five up through um, adolescence and adulthood that visual object recognition develops slowly throughout early, middle, and late childhood and does not show fully mature patterns in multiple view recognition, in configural processes, in recognition in clutter, in recognition under various forms of degradation until really late in adolescence. The point is there is a long, long road to adult prowess. We also know that human adult visual object recognition is robust because there are multiple pathways and multiple kinds of stimulus information that can be used to recognize an object. We can recognize a dog from the legs sticking out from the blanket, the airplane from the cockpit sticking out in the clouds. We can recognize objects from silhouettes. We can recognize them from fragments and uh, category diagnostic features. We can recognize them under lots of different kinds of degradation from uh, blurry images that provide only <coughs> the most global information about shape and coloring properties. We can also recognize objects um, like the Minecraft dog or the uh, airplane made from blocks. And these two uh, here, they're kind of interesting because none of the details are right. Not even the component parts. All that's sort of right about these uh, two representations that's sort of suggestive of the category shape is the relational structure of the major parts. Because so little is known about infant and toddler skills, we have been conducting what we are calling the benchmark experiments where we are trying to map the developmental trajectories for object recognition in one to three year olds from all these different kinds of st stimulus information and under various degrees of degradation. Um, it, this has been a big undertaking and it's still in progress and we actually hope to submit our first studies this fall. But here's what we know. We know that for well-known child common categories, one to two year olds are remarkably good at recognizing objects from category diagnostic features and from high contrast, high detail silhouettes. They are not good at recognizing objects under conditions of blur and they're really bad in clutter. But they also show emerging skill at recognizing objects from the relational structure of the major parts. And that's what I want to concentrate on in the next little bit. And the reason why I want to concentrate on this is recognizing objects from the relational structure of the major parts predicts the future, future, the rate of future object name learning in individual children. That is, it's not merely correlational. It predicts the future rate of object name acquisition. It predicts the future development of one instance to whole category learning in individual children. That is the shape bias. It is lacking in children with language delay and it may be an early diagnostic marker of language delay. Now here I just have to put in one little word here. We, um, we term this ability shape caricature recognition in part to um, separate it from Biederman's object-centered geon approach. There are some similarities, I think, in the phenomenon that we are studying, but we are, and I, quite explicitly, not, not adopting and not endorsing that theoretical perspective and all its underpinnings. And indeed, many of our results, and this is some other talk, some other time, contradict with the specific tenets of that um, point of view. Okay. So how do we look at um, children's ability to recognize common objects from the relational structure of the major parts? Um, what we typically do is we make objects um, from two to five major parts. In the old days, we carved them out of styrofoam. Now we 3D print them. Um, and we use various kinds of dependent measures. Name recognition, we can put the three objects out on the table and we can ask where is the camera. We use recognitory play. If a child picks up that ice cream cone and licks it, we can presume he recognized it as an ice cream cone. We've used categorization and matching tasks, both with and without object names. And all these various experiments, um, we have manipulated different structural properties, non-metric and metric properties, the shape of the major parts, the relational structure, the relative size of the parts, the major axes, elongation and symmetry, and the items in bold in case you're interested, those are the ones that matter to one and two year olds. And in almost all these experiments, um, the stimuli are three-dimensional holdable things. And 
In these experiments, we typically test children on um, the caricatures first, and then because they're one to two-year-olds who might not know every category, after that we test them on richly detailed three-dimensional examples of those categories so that we can con compare recognition of the caricatures to how well they do so when they have rich, typical, everyday things. These are the results from our very first experiment on this topic, and um, they look like every other result we found just about. Um, so on the y-axis is the proportion correct for 18 and 24 months for the shaped caricatures and for the richly detailed typical examples. And what you see for 24-month-olds, children who have just reached their second birthday, is that if they can recognize a richly detailed everyday example of a category, let's say a turtle, they can recognize its shape caricature. For 18-month-olds, there is a gap between what they can do. They are much better at recognizing richly detailed typical categories, and they falter in recognizing the shape characters. Now, these are um, bar graphs, right? And I don't want any of you to think that these children go from not being able to do it to being able to do it. Over this six-month period, children proceed at different rates, and they proceed incrementally in their ability to recognize shape caricatures. It is, at least initially, kind of category by category. Okay. The other important fact about this is that shape character recognition becomes robust in individual children two to three months before the shape bias. That is, two to three months before that one instance to whole category learning. Um, each dot in this graph is a child, and it marks a session at which the child achieves 75 percent in caricature recognition and 75 percent in being able to generalize a novel name for novel thing to new instances by shape. This was a six-month longitudinal study. No stimuli were repeated in the every three-week sessions. So what the graph shows, and if you don't get it, I can explain it later, the, that the, what the graph shows anyway is that these achievements are both strongly correlated in time, but that for individual children, reaching the benchmark for caricature recognition is prior by about six weeks or so to reaching the benchmark for the shape bias. So why does shape caricature recognition proceed and predict the emergence of one instance to whole category learning? Well, these three tractors here are the same shape only some, under some very sparse description of character, uh, some sparse description of shape. For one instance, to whole category generalization by shape to work, the perceiver needs to be able to compare objects by their global spatial structure, not the details, and needs to be able to extract that structure from a single seen thing, that John Deere tractor out in the field. From a single seen thing, of course, does not mean a single view of that thing. All right, the point I want to make up to this point before we go to in infant perspective views is that shape caricature recognition is just one pathway to visual object recognition. It's not the earliest. You might not need it, actually, to recognize well-known things. One-year-olds can't do it, and they recognize objects quite well. But it's one well worth understanding because it enables rapid, one instance, learning of novel categories. So the next part of the talk, I want to talk about what is the information, the visual information, that leads to these developments? What kinds of experiences? We know that shape caricature recognition supports object name learning. Does it also depend on object name learning? I'm not going to answer that question, although I'm going to tell you I think it's likely. Okay. So for eight years now, we have been trying to answer these questions by putting head cameras and head-mounted eye trackers on infants in order to capture their visual experiences from their perspective, from their point of view. We've used a variety of kinds of cameras. They've just gotten better. And they actually don't make much of a difference. And if people have questions about that, I can talk about it later. There's a lot of results and a lot I want to tell you. And so what I'm going to do first is give you an overview, and then I'll give you the results. Here's what I'm going to tell you, OK? That toddler views are highly selective. And they are very, very different in their scene properties and in their dynamic properties from adult views. 
often in these toddler perspective scenes there is one main object in the view it is much larger than other objects and it's more centered in the view these moments in which there is one large object dominating the view are associated with when parents name objects for children and they are associated with object name learning they are also associated with the infant holding the object that's why they're big these moments are also associated with sustained that is greater than three second long views of the object um, and these sustained viewing experience are characterized by a number of properties Children are biased in the views they show themselves, and they are biased in the rotations they show themselves. The strength of this bias in the self-generated views and rotations predicts shape character recognition. The strength of the bias in the self-generated views predicts object name vocabulary size. And then we have beginning evidence that this bias in self-generated views is actually visual in origin. It's what the eyes want to see, and the hands have to figure out how to do it. All right, so some results. In many of these experiments, what we do is we bring um, children into the laboratory, and we have them play with multiple objects at a time um, with their parent. And they either wear head cameras or head-mounted eye trackers. And the results that I show here are really a very typical pattern. This is one child. And what the y-axis shows is the percentage of the head camera image percentage pixels of which each object that the child is playing with, the red object, the green object, the blue object, is taking up in the head camera image. On the y-axis is real time in seconds. And this is the pattern we see over and over again no matter how we do it. Objects go in and out of view and they get very, very large in that view and very small. Okay? In and out of view with dynamic properties of getting very large and very close to the infant. Now, why do they get large and close? Because toddlers visually attend with their whole body. Unlike you, they're just not glancing around with their eyes. If they're interested in something, they move their head close to it, and they bring it close, okay? That's what this is about. The other interesting part is that parents, those yellow lines are those moments when a parent named the object. Parents often name objects at moments when one object dominates in the view, what one might think would be an optimal visual moment for learning the object name. These properties do not just characterize um, toddler visual experience in the lab. We have been doing these same experiments at home. That blue graph up there shows the size of the baby doll. It's now in percentage of grid squares instead of pixels. Um, of the head camera image for a child during play. I don't show the other objects because as you can see in the image, there's so many more on the floor, it's just a mass of objects. But the doll is much, much bigger uh, some of the time. And when that doll is much, much bigger or any other object the child is playing with, that is when also parents at home name the object for their child. We've also shown that uh, these Naming moments when the object is uh, large are the moments in which the child is most likely to learn the object name. So um, in these experiments, uh, the ones looking at object name learning, we use novel words and objects, and we train the parents before the experiment as to those object names so that when they name the objects, they'll use our names. Then the toddler and parent come in and they play together with the objects. And then after play, an experimenter conducts a word learning test, three alternative force choice, to determine whether the toddler has learned any of those object names. And um, here we show um, the two main results, OK? What we do is we go back in, and for all the object names that the child learned, we go back in and we look at the visual properties that characterize the naming events associated with learned object names, and then we compare them to the naming events associated with not learned object names. And the main property I want to talk about now is the visual size of the object. And so if you look in uh, little graph C here, what this shows, I'm going to step forward, I don't need a clicker. This is 
when the object was named. And now we're looking at the visual properties 10 seconds prior to naming and up to 10 seconds after naming. And on the y-axis is the size of the target or the size of the largest competitor object on the t in the view. Okay? And what you can see for learned object names, the size of the name target is visually much larger than the size of a potential competitor. And moreover, that that advantage, that visual advantage is sustained. It's reliable for five seconds okay, around that naming moment. Okay? For unlearned object names, there's a little hint of an advantage, but it doesn't last, okay, and it's not as big. Okay? Visual competition clutters a big deal for these guys. Uh, the second graph over there shows that um, these visually optimal moments when the object is large and kept large relative to competitors for a sustained period um, are primarily due to the child holding the object, not the parent holding the object. So where we are to this point, I've told you the toddler views are hi highly selective, that they often have one object that's visually larger and more centered and that these moments are associated with naming by the parent and object name learning by the child, and they're associated with the infant holding the object, and they're also associated with sustained, longer than three second views of the objects. What I want to tell you next is what the properties of these sustained views are like, okay? And the data I'm going to tell you about now comes from actually um, experiments done in the lab where we had the head camera really very carefully calibrated to capture the view, line of sight view, when the child is holding the object. And what we do here is we give children objects to hold and visually explore and play with. We don't give them any way to put them down, not for the experiments I'm going to tell you about. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how long, how long the, uh, we're going to look at what the dwell maps are, where, what views they show themselves. But what I want to show you first are the, um, views from adults when we do it the same way. So these experiments have been done before by Harmon, Humphrey, and Goodall, and Parrott, and Harris, but they used joysticks with adults. We did adults the same way we did with children. We just gave them objects to hold and told them to study the objects. And so then you get a view map around the sphere, around the hold object, and we're going to lay it flat. And this is what a dwell map looks like for adults in our experiments. And you can see that they are very, very selective. There are lots and lots and lots of parts of these objects they don't look at at all. Instead, they focus on four main points. And those four main points, as Parrott and Harry's first noted, are what they call the planar views. Views in which the major axes are perpendicular or parallel to the line of sight. And views that are rotations in depth around the most elongated axes. Okay. So that's what it looks like in adults. Here's what it looks like in children. All right. So the four main results, I think, are really obvious if you look at these dwell maps. Okay. First of all, you can see that there is increasing selectivity in the views generated as the children get older. One-year-olds have a lot of schmear pink, no real yellow spots. Okay whereas the two-and-a-half-year-olds have clear hot spots. Second, those hot spots for two-and-a-half-year-olds are exactly where they are for adults. Okay? They are also biased to those planar views that are rotations around the object in depth. Third, though, you can see that those one-year-olds, they may not have hot spots, but they have warm spots. And those warm spots are in the same places as the hot spots are for adults. Okay? And third, what you don't see in adults because they're so skilled, see that schmear? That is just not quite making it, but rotating that object in depth. Okay. All right. So to sum up to this point, these are one at what babies are getting, one to two year olds, are one at a time object views. Those one at a time object views elicit naming by parents and they lead to the learning of those object names by children. But these views fall within a structured stream of visual experiences that favor some views over others, 
and that favor some object rotations over others, and that arguably might be the views and the object rotations that are going to lead to the ability to abstract the relational structure of complex shapes. But whatever it's doing, I think we need to understand it because this is the training input for the fundamentals of human visual object recognition. We also know that the strength of the bias in these manually generated views is correlated with object name vocabulary size. It is correlated with the toddler's visual memory for a viewed object after delay and is correlated with the recognition of shape caricatures. We do not yet know the direction of the causal arrow, but it is likely to be in both directions with incremental change in one ability supporting learning and incremental change in the other abilities. Finally, I'll just mention this quickly. We have evidence that suggests that this may be an initial visual bias, and this is a topic we're working heavily on now. We wanted to see what the role of the biomechanics of holding the hand object was to generating these views. So we took objects that we used in regular experiments, and we put them fixed, firmly fixed inside plexiglass spheres. So now how you hold the object is equipotential to the view you get. When you do that, when you take the hands out of it, you actually get stronger planar biases, okay? The hands are getting in the way of what these children are trying to do, okay? We're now trying to do these experiments with babies to see if they actually learn about objects better when they see high quality rotations like an adult or older child would do than when they see the kind of murky stuff that very young children do. All right. So toddler views are highly selective, one object at a time, sustained, support object name learning, and they have really specific dynamic and structured properties in a stream. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. If we want to understand how visual object categories carve nature at its joints for one to two year olds, we're going to need much more about the training set. And so that's where I will conclude with just letting you know about our future work. We are trying to build a corpus of infant perspective scenes and the co-occurring naming events using head cameras by infants worn at home. We're asking what's in front of babies' heads, and we're asking when are early learned object categories named for infants. So far, we've collected uh, head cameras at home from 75 infants aged zero to two years. We're trying to get six hours per baby and typically in a one day. So we get the full span of kind of the visual events in a day. Um, to this point, we have 400,000 frames annotated um, for the first uh, 50 normatively acquired object names. Let me just say a tiny bit as a teaser about where we're going, okay? Babies see have a lot of tokens of cups in their experience. But 90% of those cups are just one cup, their own sippy cup, okay? There is a really steep distribution, okay? Zippian in nature or Zippian-like, very, very steep. But that one sippy cup, they see it in lots and lots and lots of contexts. They see it near. They see it far. They see it occluded. They see it upright normal. They see it upside down. They see it when they're holding it. They see it when they drop it, okay? They see it for sustained views, when they're drinking with it for a 10 second period. And they see it across the room when they just turn their head and see it sitting on a table, okay? Our instinct is very few objects in the early stages lots and lots of contexts in which that object is seen may really build the power of human visual object recognition. So on that, I will um, conclude. Uh, I want to note my collaborators at Indiana, Chen Yu, Susan Jones, and Karen James, and all the infant work. And we have just begun and got a new grant with um, Jim Reg to look at some of the uh, egocentric videos. And we've had a number of outstanding um, postdocs and graduate students who have contributed to this. Down here, because somebody in the audience always asks about head-eye alignment and all this data from the head cameras, these are the gaze distribution for toddlers, okay? Doing lots of different activities, and as you can see, that gaze is in the center, okay? 
Thank you very much.